I definitely um, did not feel at home in the family and in the white world. It felt foreign to me and it felt uncomfortable and awkward to be there. And it also felt um, oppressive because I had to constantly mask and subordinate and repress parts of myself in order to just kind of survive socially. You describe a pretty horrific childhood, one of punishment and negligence and very little love. Oftentimes when I was being punished, I was left wondering um, what I really had done to deserve that punishment because I felt like I had just been being myself. You know, I had just been being creative or spontaneous or dancing or just doing something that I hadn't intentionally been doing something wrong or evil or terrible. It was just, um, but I'd stepped out of line. I hadn't, you know, done what a girl should do. <laughs> I had somehow been, you know, immodest or sensual or something. And I had to, you know, be punished for that because I was being raised to believe that the only goal for me in life was to get married and bear children and be a good wife and mother. And as soon as you were able, you looked for college, that headlong dash towards the black world. Was it then that your appearance started to change? Did you become more aware of wanting to become more black physically? Well, when I was in college, um, I was constantly, you know, kind of trying to explain and defend who I was because a lot of people saw me as either um, mixed or albino or light skinned black, whether or not I had braids, like regardless of my hairstyle, um, because I was in the Black Student Union and I was always um, fighting for racial and social justice, which wasn't typical for white Southerners to do. So it was kind of glaringly not fitting the mold of whiteness in the South. And if somebody saw me and assumed I was black or mixed or light skinned, I, it, it was more comfortable because it was a box that I could be put in. When you started ticking the box that said black eventually, did you feel uncomfortable? Did it feel like a lie? No. I mean, it, it didn't feel like a lie, for sure. It felt like um, a true representation of who I am and what I stand for. Because in race, even, even though race is a social construct in America, there is a very clear color line. There's a very clear divide, and you have to take a side. Like, I stand on the black side of issues philosophically, politically, socially, and for me to not check that box, I felt like would be some sort of a betrayal of not only who I am, but also the community I affiliate with. But a lot of people might say, I sympathize with everything that the black movement stands for, mm -hmm. yet I recognize my own ethnicity. You didn't. Well, in that case, people would be agreeing with the idea that race is biological. The idea of race is a lie. So how can you lie about a lie? The criticism uh, that came was that you were trying to culturally appropriate uh, a black experience that you couldn't have had because you never lived through it. What's your response to that criticism? I understand that um, given what was presented, I understand how people can come up with those conclusions. But I do feel like just because I didn't have a lived experience being seen by other people as a black girl, a black young woman, um, for years of my life, I was seen as a white woman, as a white girl. Um, that doesn't mean that I didn't have any experiences. Many of our viewers <laughs> will quite simply be confused by that, by the idea that you could have a choice that I couldn't self-define as Chinese just because I had a passion 
for Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that to some extent that's right because we don't have a choice in how we are born and who we are. And so to embrace and fully own who you really are, I think is something that we encourage from children's movies to are the most inspirational books and whether fictional or accurate. I think that we tell, we tell everybody, be who you are, be proud of who you are. And this is truly who I am. But do you think you had a choice? Did you have a choice to be black? I was born as who I am. And that includes how I feel and also what I look like. And so I, I don't think that I have a choice in, in that. You've drawn parallels um, with the transgender community that you should be able to self-define racially mm -hmm. in the way that many trans people self-define their gender. Yeah, well, and actually um, many other people have drawn those parallels too. And I kind of have seen that as somewhat useful just because gender is understood. We've, we've progressed, we've evolved into understanding that gender is not binary, it's not um, even biological, you know. But what strikes me as so odd is that race isn't biological either. And actually race has been to some extent less biological than gender if you really think about history and our bodies, um, we are type A or type O or whatever blood, we don't, there isn't like white blood and black blood and you know, there's not like body parts that are, you know, certain, you know. So you, you, know, so, you believe so, in, in a concept of transracial? Well, I, I believe that the word transracial has become socially useful in describing racial fluidity and identity. Do you think though that the world will come round to your way of thinking or do you think you'll always be viewed as the the pariah, the, the white woman who wanted to be black? I don't know. I don't think that that's for me to hope for or predict. I don't, I really don't, don't know where we're headed. I would hope. Describe for us now what life is like day to day, you can't get a job, you don't have money. Right. Was that all as a result of this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was a result of me being discredited, basically called a liar and a fraud and a con and people not trusting um, my work. I mean, not just my identity, but everything that I did, including my resume, was called into question. I'm so stigmatized right now, not just at large, but especially in this town where I have to stay here in this region um, to be a mother to Franklin. And I am just highly um, stigmatized and ostracized. It's very hostile. Are you recognized when you go out? Yes. And what? No matter how I do my hair, I'm still recognized. <laughs> and what do people say to you? Um, some people stop me in the grocery store and say like, oh my goodness, did you know that you look like that one white woman who said she was black but she wasn't? And then laugh, you know, and it's just like, that's interesting, you know, is what I say. And then they say, oh, it's just, it's not a bad thing because she was, she was, she was quite pretty, you know, or something. It's just kind of like this awkward moment where people who don't recognize me still associate me with Rachel Dolezal. Where was the worst criticism for you? What, what hurt most? I would say that the, the biggest um, attack was from, of course, through the parents and the white media and the white police and the, you know, the white establishment at large really dealt the biggest blow. But the criticism that hurt the worst was from the black community because I still um, feel like that's home for me. And even if I get evicted or get pushed to the fringe or some people don't see me as part of that group, it's still where I feel like I fit and where I feel at home. So um, that hurts. It's painful because I feel like there's uh, misunderstanding 
that I want to resolve. If I could resolve one group's misunderstanding, it would be the black community for sure.